Hello, it's a pleasure to be joining the Adventurous Wives Conference. My paper is titled The Impartiality and Wisdom of My Judges, The Legal Adventures of Mary Bose, Countess of Strathmore. I want to begin by acknowledging that I'm recording this paper and joining you from the land of the Dharawal people, land that is entwined in networks of custodian, kinship and belonging among Australia's First Nations people, land that was taken by force and never ceded. And I pay my respects to the leaders of the Dharawal Nation past, present and emerging. I also want to begin by issuing a content warning to say that my paper includes discussion of violence against women, including various forms of domestic violence and sexual assault. So if that is something that could be upsetting or triggering for you, please take care while you're watching. So my paper today explores the legal adventures of Mary Bowes, who's Countess of Strathmore. Bose was embroiled in a range of legal proceedings in the 1780s and 90s through her attempts to use the rights and remedies available to her as an 18th century wife to extricate herself and her property from her tyrannical husband, Andrew Robinson Stoney Bowes. In this paper, I'm going to explore aspects of her self-representation in relation to her litigation trials and how she responded and the public response to them throughout 18th century print culture. Okay, so this is a portrait of the young Mary Bowes. She was born in 1749. She was the only child of George Bowes, who was a wealthy coal miner. While she was still a teenager, she inherited her father's fortune, estates and mines. She was intelligent and highly educated and throughout her life, she had strong interests in literature and particularly in botany. And she used her wealth to construct great greenhouses and source plants from all over around the globe. When she came of age, she was one of England's wealthiest heiresses and she acquired a celebrity status also through her taste for fashionable metropolitan life, her association with members of the Blue Stocking Circle, particularly Elizabeth Montague. In 1767, on her 18th birthday, Bowes married John Lyon, Earl of Strathmore, and they went on to have five children before the Earl's death in 1776. Her marriage to the Earl was neither contented nor intellectually satisfying and was characterised by long periods of separation. She commenced an affair with George Grey during her marriage and agreed to marry him shortly after the Earl's death, death even as she began to be courted by the man who eventually would become her second husband, Andrew Robinson Stoney, who I'll refer to as Stoney throughout this paper. In January 1777, Stoney concocted a sham jewel, ostensibly to defend Bose's honour when she became the target of gossip and scandal in the Morning Post. He fabricated a fatal injury in the jewel, which was later confirmed by his doctor, and persuaded Bose to marry him as his last dying wish. She agreed and went through with the ceremony, but soon after the wedding discovered the true nature of Stoney's health his temper and his extraordinary capacity for emotional manipulation, psychological abuse and physical violence. Shortly before her marriage to Stoney, but in anticipation of her marriage to Grey, Bose executed a deed placing all of her fortunes and estates in trust for her sole use. Stoney was enraged when he discovered this deed and in May 1777, he threatened Bose with violence, forcing her to execute a new deed, revoking the prenuptial settlement and transferring all her property solely to him. Throughout the marriage, Bose endured physical and sexual assault, psychological and emotional abuse, starvation, imprisonment, financial deprivation and social ostracism. Stoney was a serial sexual predator who assaulted and impregnated numerous strong women, particularly young servants. Bose lived under his control for eight years before she escaped in 1785 with the assistance of trusted servants and she secreted herself in a house in Holborn. And it was this escape that triggered Bose's legal adventures because she immediately commenced proceedings against Stoney to protect herself, her children and her property. She exhibited and was granted articles of peace against him by Lord Mounts Mansfield in the King's Bench. She also commenced proceedings to formalise her separation um, in the London Consistory Court, um, seeking a separation of bed and board. 
um, which was upheld uh, in May 1786. She was granted a divorce but without the right to remarry on the grounds of cruelty and adultery together with um, alimony. Stoney immediately appealed to the Court of Archers. But then in November 1786, in fear of the divorce being upheld, he bribed the local constabulary and had Bowes abducted from her home in London. He carried her across the North Countryside, imprisoning her in a, in a castle in Durham in a vi violent attempt to compel her to withdraw the suit, at one time holding a pistol to her head to unsuccessfully force her to sign documents. Bowes was finally rescued 10 days after her abduction and Stoney was imprisoned in the King's Bench to await trial. She successfully prosecuted him for abduction and he was imprisoned in the King's Bench from which he continued to thwart her attempts to use legal remedies to remove herself from his grasp. In 1787, the Court of Archers upheld her divorce but the following and the following year, Bowes went a step further seeking and obtaining a declaration from the Court of Common Pleas that the deed she executed after her marriage, the one that vested her estates and property in Stoney, was null and void on the grounds that it was obtained under duress. This left open the question of who was the legal owner of her property, and in 1788, Bowes obtained through Chancery a declaration that the deed she'd executed way back in 1776, the one where she made, she made an anticipation of her marriage to Gray, reserving all of her property and estates to herself was valid. In 1789, Stoney made a final appeal to the Court of Delegates against his divorce, but to no avail. Her legal entanglements with Stoney did continue into the 1790s, but they particularly related to property disputes, but this is the scope of my paper today. As one might imagine, both the scope and nature of Bo's legal adventures attracted significant public attention. Stoney himself, his associates, and the newspaper, pamphlet, and legal press took a significant interest in these cases, both because they tested the boundaries of the law in relation to wives and also because of their salacious content and its capacity to meet the seemingly insatiable 18th century appetite for sex, scandal, and gossip. Here are some examples of Stoney's attempts to influence public opinion and also the judiciary. Following his arrest for his abdication, for his abduction, sorry, he paid James Gilray to prepare and publish two prints relating to the case. One on the left is titled The Injured Countess S, depicting Bose carousing in a tavern as sexually available and as cruel to both her servants, one is seated here on the right, and also to her children, and one of her children is depicted there um, on the left-hand side of the print. The print on the left represents Stoney himself, drawn as feeble and haggard being presented before the king's bench, um, and this is when he is being presented for trial following the abduction. Stoney had also purchased a controlling interest in the Universal Register later the Times and began to publish articles to tarnish both his reputation as well as to draw further interest to the scandalous details that he hoped to reveal in the course of the trial. Yet throughout the hearings and the trials, Bose's voice itself is curiously muted, if not absent. Indeed, the only example I've been able to find of Bose speaking publicly is in this letter published in the Morning Chronicle in January 1777. And it also becomes between her abduction and Stoney's trial and the divorce appeal before the Court of Arches. And Bose writes in response to the increasing publicity from Stoney surrounding her case. And her comments relate specifically to acceptable forms of public speech in the context of an ongoing legal dispute. So her, remark, her letter is remarkable for both its singularity and its purpose because it's perhaps her only public salvo into this print, print frenzy that surrounded her legal adventures, her cause as she described it. So she writes, I was perfectly satisfied that no idle paragraph or malicious aspersions from any person could possibly have the slightest influence over the impartiality and wisdom of my judges in the various courts of justice. And that on the contrary, any circumstance which bears the appearance of such an insolent attempt can only excite their just indignation. My respect for the estimable and revered characters who preside in the law departments will not permit me to offer one word of vindication before any other tribunal previous to the decision of my cause. 
that after the cause is finally decided, I shall think myself at liberty to enter upon a full detail of Mr. Bowe's conduct towards myself and others, and to lay before the public such facts as are attested by convincing proofs and authorities, and will carry with them the stamp of veracity. So here Bowes is clearly differentiating herself from Stoney's attempted manipulation of the judiciary through the press, and she ref referencing any other tribunal as the tribunal of the public. However, Bose is also differentiating herself from the several women who did speak publicly about their experiences of justice in the 18th century. In text, I refer to as legal memoirs. Some of these women, particularly those on the left, are reasonably well known, while, as though, while others, those in the column on the right, are comparatively unknown. Each of these women used the genre of published life writing to publicly and intentionally interrogate their experiences of the justice system. Indeed, I came across Bose through my research into these memoirs. I realised, however, that she doesn't fit with this approach because of the dramatically different approach she takes to her self-representation in the context of litigation. And although you can see her name here, that refers to her unpublished memoir and not to her self-representation and public engagement while the litigation wasn't going in which she was comparatively silent. What then to make of Bose's letter? Is she ego stroking the judges and the judiciary? Does she have a genuine belief in the powers of legal process to deliver justice? The fact that she executed the deed in contemplation of marriage suggests she had a high level of understanding and a certain level of faith in legal processes. And she certainly was very proactive in making use of the legal processes that were available to her? Or could we in fact frame Bose's silence as itself a litigation strategy? Bose knows because of her predecessors that the power of print is available to her. It is apparent from her letter that she understands this to be within her grasp. But she actively renounces the idea of an appeal to the tribunal of the public. In doing so, Bose portrays herself as the quiet, passive and victimised wife, an image that was central to her legal claims. And this process was particularly important because of the emergence of the so-called scandalous memoir genre and its connection to legal process from the mid-18th century. And that in itself generated significant difficulties for Bose throughout her litigation. In February 1778, just one year into her marriage, Bowes composed a text she referred to as a narrative addressed to Stoney in which she records what she describes as her crimes and imprudencies, and these include her abortions, her extramarital liaisons and her affairs, as well as an account of her childhood, adolescence and education to which she attributes her faults of character. Although the exact circumstances surrounding the composition of the narrative are uncertain, it's clear that at the very least it was written on Stoney's instructions and under some form of duress. Stoney kept the narrative for 10 years as a kind of insurance policy, lest Bowie should ever attempt to leave him, and then attempted to adduce it in, as evidence in the Court of Arches Appeal in 1787. After the first five pages were read, the judges dismissed it as being irrelevant because it concerned um, conduct that occurred before the marriage and because they recognised it had been obtained under duress. But the pages that were read were substantially reproduced in the Universal Register, among other newspapers. They were also reproduced in these kinds of legal paratexts that surrounded Bose's cause. And these types of texts represent the merging of law, life writing and scandal, evident in the burgeoning market for crim con and other adultery trial publications, together with accounts of sexual and violent crimes. So although Bose's case wasn't a crim con case, the combination of adultery and violence fit the bill nevertheless. And these publications expose the vulnerability of wives like Bose, even as they sought to enforce their legal rights with the least possible intervention in the public sphere. So the select reports of, the, of Doctors Commons featured this engraving of the Countess of Strathmore with George Grey the evening previous to her marriage with Andrew Robinson Stoney Bowes. 
and it substantially reproduced Bose's narrative well beyond what was read in the Court of Archers. It was further reproduced in the Cuckold's Chronicle together with a lurid account of Stoney's sexual violence. And Stoney himself eventually published it with added epigrams as the Confessions of the Countess of Strathmore uh, in 1793. So what Bowes' case re reveals so starkly is the kind of public treatment that wives expose themselves to in the course of enforcing their legal rights. Even something, as seemingly innocuous as having her deed to Stoney declared in ballad and her petition to Chancery to have her prenuptial deed declared ballad attracted publications of this kind. For in seeking to re regain control of her property, Bose had to publicise through the courtroom details of the sham jewel by which she had been lured, lured into marriage, her liaison with George Grey and Stoney's um, violence towards her. And these were reported in, in this document on the left, um, a trial report taken in shorthand and published as a pamphlet, a full and accurate report of the trial between Stevens, commonly um, trustee to um, Bowes, commonly called Countess of Strathmore, and Andrew Robinson Stoney Bowes, which was published in May 1788. This was the first print publication of the fabricated jewel of Stoney's control of every aspect of Bose's life, including her servants, her visitors, her correspondence and her use of her carriage and his violence against her, as well as her liaison with Grey. It was so popular, it quickly went into second and third editions. Eventually, however, the case, which denied Stoney his usual proprietary rights as a husband, became a widely reported legal precedent and is an example of one of its many reproductions as a legal precedent on the right-hand side. But what this also did was inscribe Bose's affair with Grey and the sham jewel with Stoney into the English law. And this suggests that Bose's silence, the faith that she placed in the impartiality and wisdom of my judges, was ultimately a successful litigation strategy. Bowes would eventually write her own memoir, as she suggested that she might in her letter to the Morning Chronicle. But it is housed in the Bowes Museum and has never been published. Present circumstances make it unlikely that I will be able to access it any time soon to shed further light from Bowes herself on her legal adventures. If you're interested in my research and would like to get in touch, here are my contacts set out below. I look forward to discussing this further in the conference.